so I start, I get these from a stationary store, BJ's out of North Battleford, but I'm, and they're just 11 by 17 page dividers for 11 by 17 binder. I like to cut the tab off. I, I have pre-turned two pieces of wood. One will be the base that I'll turn my tenon on and it'll be the bottom of the mold. And the other piece I've drilled holes in it because we gotta keep the wood pieces will float in the epoxy. So we have to hold the wood pieces down. So that I'll use later on in the presentation. And then you just, whichever way, it really doesn't matter, whatever height you want. Just takes a little practice to get it rolled up. I try and roll it up so it is as tight as possible to my wood piece. I get it squared up as best I can. It takes a little bit of practice and patience just to get it rolled and keep it square all the way around. Once I've got it rolled up, I take one piece of tuck tape and I just put it on so it holds the shape. The next piece I do is I push it, push the wood piece out so it's you can see it's it's a little loose, so I'm gonna retry this again. This wood piece as square as possible to the end. Once I have that done, then I go back to the roll of duct tape. Then I place it so it overlaps the divider, the wood piece. And depending on how much, about half of it that you can fold in a little in the next step of the process. I'm trying to seal between the plastic and the wood because that slow set epoxy will find every little crook, every little nanny. The tuck tape, it'll debond the tuck tape from the wood piece. So you gotta make sure it's sealed underneath to hold it in. I am starting to play with duct tape because duct tape seems to stick to the wood and the epoxy doesn't affix, uh, affect it as much as the tuck tape. But it's a little more difficult to work with, a little more expensive. So whatever you find works, just use it. To me, tape is cheap. So when you think you've had enough tape on it, put two more layers on. Epoxy is expensive, tape is cheap. And then because I'm a little, I want to make sure it doesn't get out, I'll do two more layers of tape across the bottom. And then I'll do one roll right at the bottom just to seal all that in and hold it. And that'll become my mold. This one here, I've just put in one layer of, of duct tape around the bottom. And then I've did two layers, the two 90 degree layers, and then one layer of uh, tuck tape around the outside and I'm going to give that a try and see if this holds it. Now for adding wood pieces, I've brought a whole bunch of stabilized pieces that I've sanded and cleaned. Uh, what I do is I like to sand, I've been sanding to 120 but I'm debating about stopping at 80 instead so it's a, there's a little more lines in it because then the epoxy will hold into those marks and you probably won't see it. So you can't uh, sand it to a mirror finish because then the epoxy won't hold on to it as easily. It becomes a weaker joint. I always start with an untreated wood piece in the bottom so that when I turn it off, I can write my name in, in that. The stabilized pieces, if you start with those, uh, you can't always, if it's taken the stabilizing dye, it's hard to use your hot uh, your uh, burners to burn your name into it. So I always start with an untreated piece 
Um, and then you can just start randomly throwing pieces in here. Try and find the cheapest tape because all you're, all you're trying to do is hold the wood pieces down. So then I'll just stick this on. It's, a, it's another juggling act, but. And again, this is just to hold that wood piece in place. I stick it in a pitcher because now it won't fall over or tilt on me while I'm pouring the epoxy. And if my uh, tape job was not adequate, it'll leak out into the pitcher and with a slow, uh, slow uh, carrying epoxy, you can sometimes take it and dump it back into the top and use it again if it hasn't set up. So I like it because it now it won't fall over for sure. So you just try and remove all the tape. You find the, the joint that you taped up. there's kind of two different types of epoxies. One is set by basically generating its own heat and one that's, I'm going to call it more of a chemical process. Doesn't generate as much heat, generates very little heat. You can, if you control your room temperature, you can control how quickly it sets. You can take it from uh, the Econopox, I believe, is rated at 24. I've taken it out uh, three, four, five days in a cool garage. Just gives it more time to set, more time for the air to get out. I've seen some YouTube videos where guys will put it in the refrigerator to keep it from setting. Now, this is my personal opinion. The, typically, the heat set ones, I believe, have more shrinkage than the chemical set. So if you're pouring it into a fixed chunk of wood, as it cures, it's going to shrink and it's going to be more likely to crack on you. I've had that heat set stuff. I use a product as well. I first started casting with a product from Home Hardware called Easy Cast. That's a thermal set. And I put about this much in a, pla or I had the plastic glass filled up. I got it down to about that. My mold was full. And I thought, well, I'll just keep the rest there. Came back 15 minutes. It was, it was set already. The center of the epoxy had cracked because it had shrunk so much. And the plastic glass had melted in about a quarter of an inch as it was set. So it can it generate tremendous amount of heat. So when you're picking your epoxies, each epoxy is rated for how thick. Some of them have a minimum thickness that you can pour it. Some have, most of them have a maximum thickness. If you're getting the heat set ones, do not exceed the maximum thickness because it'll generate a lot of heat. If your moisture's not 100% dry, it'll drive moisture out of the wood as that heat's being generated and create more bubbles in your epoxy. So when you're selecting your epoxy, absolutely understand what you're buying. Minimum thickness, maximum thickness, what temperatures you should be looking at to pour it. Uh, the, the, the big reasons that I know of that epoxy won't set up, one, especially if it's a heat set, uh, your room temperature or the epoxy is too cold and it can't generate enough heat to get itself going to set. Pay attention to your mix ratios. There's lots out there that are one to one, and there's lots out there that are two to one. So you gotta watch which ones you're using so you get the right percentages. So this is what I start with. This is my casting. Once I take it out of the mold, and just to save time here, 
I've turned a tenant on the bottom and I'll talk that I always put a wood piece on the bottom because I always like to make a tenant out of wood. I do not like to make it out of epoxy. I always want end grain. I always want end grain because if the grain's going this way, I find my tenant cracks off on me. I've also then went a little bit further uh, and just I've, tenon, I've made a tenant here. I've turned it smooth and I've drilled a hole down the, bo the bottom of this. With my little hole hollowing system, I find if I get about a three inch mold, it gives me enough with the small bar that I have in my hope turning system to hollow the vase out. So usually what I do first is I make the top, I'll form the outside of the top piece and I'll just form a little bit past the hill as I start to come down so I can get an idea of the shape for when I'm hollowing. I like to leave as much as the bottom as possible at the full size just for extra stability during the hollowing process. With the hollowing system that I have, you will notice that it's bouncing a, a fair amount, but between the wood, cutting wood epoxy, wood epoxy, wood epoxy, it's, you know, it's cutting at different hardnesses and stuff. So it does tend to jump a little bit more than if you were cutting, let's say, straight wood that's all one consistency. So with that, I'll get into just uh, turning. And you see you turn into Santa Claus after a while. Just going to check the diameter. I've drilled a one inch hole down the center of this already. So I just want to make sure I don't get it too deep here. I like to get this down to just under an inch and a half. I set this about two inches, about, excuse me, two thirds of the diameter I'm going to leave here. And I like that down to just under an inch and a half. So I got a little more I can take out. What I also like to do is I go about two thirds from here to here. I like to narrow the narrowest part of my vase to be about two thirds of the way down. And then I try and get that equal to this diameter here. So I just want to mark that two thirds position just so I know where to go to. But as soon as I mark that, I'm going to switch and move on to the hollowing system because I don't want to remove any more of this. I've kind of got the slope that I want to do inside and I want maximum thickness for the maximum stability. Today I'm going to be using my hope system that I bought from hope. Hope is out of uh, Europe. I love the Hope system for my little lathe. I will never take it to my big lathe. I use Elio system on my big lathe. So just to give me more room to hollow, the next thing I'll do is I'll trim out the, the top of my vase first. And I'll always use my gouge for that. That's just what I've gotten used to doing it with. Okay, now we'll move into using the hollowing system. And because I'm gonna start shaping out here, I'm gonna gotta move my tool rest out a little bit just to make sure I don't get onto the slope piece because you need that solid support for the tool rest. Smaller pieces like this, you got to empty the chip slot. 
you can usually develop a feel over time when it's cutting free or when the chips are getting in there bouncing off your cutting bar it's you you feel it after time after you get a little practice with it And of course with bigger vases you can make it start with a bigger hole you don't have to stop as frequent then to clear the chips I always like to insert the tool when it's not running it, it just it's a smaller hole if you're off a little bit you bang it or something you can create lots of in interesting things I'm just trying to work that bottom of where the drill bit went in the very center. The next step, once I get it hollow completely, I'll switch out the carbide tip, tip to a scraper. This is from Crown Tools. And I just use a scraper because I can get a much better finish. With the carbides, I tend to get a, a wavy inside. So this just helps to finish it off and give it a nice smooth. I'll sand a little bit down into the throat in that, but I won't ever sand past that. We'll just start with this. I use, I like the Aberneth. I start with it first. One thing about epoxy you and dry sanding is you can't stay in one spot too long and can't push too hard because otherwise you'll overheat it and start melting it. And then it turns into a gooey mess and it becomes a problem. So now I'm moving up to 180. And once I move into the power sanding and the drill, I turn it as slow as the lathe will go. I just got to go grab my water and uh, if you guys want to come up and just have a look at how smooth that looks already. But usually the last pass is when I do the wet sanding. Keep it just to the one pass because it does make a bit of a mess. It's a little messier. I always, I forgot this time, but I'll sometimes put a paper towel down so the water doesn't hit the bed. So you can just have a look to see how that sanded out just with that short amount of sanding that I've done. Mm -hmm. 